will now displace the, the uh, witnesses from this front seat and ask our panelists if they would kindly move up to the front. We, we have, uh, now which order are we going in again? The uh, film first and then the We're going to the um, hold on, panelists. Yes, yes. We're, we're going to be asking our panelists to, uh, to share with us some reflections, some brief reflections on the process that they have so generously been a part of. Uh, now, um, please be assured that we're not asking them to give us a sneak preview of the report that they're going to write. There are going to be ongoing uh, critical discussions and reflections and exchanges among the panelists. There's going to be um, uh, a, a process of uh, editing and, and, and formulation that will follow this. But they've kindly consented at this point to share with us uh, some, some reflections as our four-day hearings draw to a close. Um, we will please remember, uh, following their short reflections, uh, we will be having a, um, to the, the video statements or video witnessing by uh, two family members. And uh, we will then be uh, closing with um, some brief comments by Professor Matthew Witt. Uh, that is an excellent idea. Let me give them, let me see if I can stretch the better mic around. Uh, this microphone may not reach as far as Professor Jenkins, <laughs> but let's see. Yes. It reaches. Should I hold on to it? Well, I've been really much honored to have been asked to serve uh, on this panel, and I'm grateful to all of the organizers for their very gracious and purposeful and disciplined conduct of the hearings. And I'm grateful to the witnesses for all they have achieved. And although I hope I'm not going to be tested on it, I really have learned a great deal. I think we face an uphill battle in our effort to establish a real inquiry into the horrific events of 9-11. And a necessary part of that battle was advanced in our four days of hearings. We have focused on the strongest evidence and reasoned arguments that the official account of 9-11 is not true. Any open-minded person, in my view, who genuinely seeks the truth and is willing to examine the evidence would support a real inquiry with the power to subpoena witnesses and with the political clout to pry loose from a secretive government evidence that they have so far managed to suppress. If the decision as to whether or not to conduct a real inquiry were to be made by a jury of scientists and leaders in the cause of justice and human rights, 9-11 skeptics might have a good chance. But if, as I fear, in the end, the matter will not be decided by such a jury, our success may depend on more progress in changing public perceptions. And that depends on our ability to open minds to the disturbing evidence that some part of our democratic state is guilty of mass murder of its citizens. And on this point, there are serious obstacles to overcome. 
Focusing on the best evidence will continue to be necessary, but it may not be sufficient. I want to address just one of the serious obstacles to getting the needed change in public perception. I believe it is in the minds of many thoughtful people that sustaining our democratic society requires a certain level of trust in our institutions and in our elected and appointed representatives who work within those institutions. Thoughtful people will know that Americans' trust in the state is at an historic low. The pervasiveness of distrust is almost palpable. They may see people like those of us gathered here today as merchants of distrust who are concerned not only that some members of government in high places are ready to commit mass murder of American citizens to advance their agenda, but so many of the individuals that work within our institutions are unable or unwilling to stop them. Some of them will see us as engaged in a wholly destructive effort to remove the last vestiges of trust and with it the motivation of citizens to participate in the work of democracy. If we succeed, they might say, nothing would remain but self-seeking corporate power in an unregulated marketplace. I think they misunderstand what we really want. We really want to begin a long process of rebuilding trust in the democratic state in the only way it can be done within the law, by opening the government to the legitimate needs of its citizens to know and to see and to be heard. By strengthening the Freedom of Information Act and restructuring our institutions by making them more open to the eyes of its citizens and more responsive to their voices, we do not and should not trust a secretive government operating in the shadows, committing atrocities and using the instruments of power to keep us in the dark. To let the doubts surrounding 9-11 to fester in the dark would lead to the ultimate destruction of trust. To open up to the, to the legitimate rights of the people to know is the only feasible path to rebuilding trust. That is the positive program of the skeptics of 9-11. That's what we should be engaged in. We should be a movement to rebuild trust through real inquiry. To bring about a rebirth of democracy and trust in the United States, this must be done in and by the people and, and some part of the state together. It cannot be achieved through a foreign power or an international body. If it is to be our rebirth, we have to be the fathers and the mothers. First of all, I'd like to say that um, as a Torontonian, I'm very proud that these hearings were held in my hometown and that uh, down through history they say, ah, the Toronto hearings, those, that was a key turning point. So I'm happy as a, uh, as a Torontonian. Second of all, I realize that uh, for the last four days my colleagues and I have been living the academic dream. We get a, an array of star witnesses with absolutely uh, special, thoroughly documented data to lay before us, and we get first crack at them. And uh, so that is kind of uh, my second uh, thought. But as we leave the room and head out to the hall, we see the CBC News World is on or CNN is on, and of course the world out there is very different. 
And so what we see out there is uh, the public face of the 9-11 story, which is a, math of, a mass of mythology hardening into theology and hardening into dogma. Uh, there's a, as Laurie Manuel uh, so skillfully laid out for us, there's a massive psychological investment in these myths by the public, even by the public who otherwise may be highly critical of the government of the U.S. and have no illusions about uh, its its uh, flaws, but nevertheless are not able to embrace the evidence that we've been dealing with here. One of the rhetorical devices used by the official story is to uh, say that we critics uh, are showing disrespect for the dead. And uh, on the contrary, it seems really important to say that by really seeking the true sources of their tragedy, of their deaths, we are showing real respect for them and not crying crocodile tears. So I think that's a very important point. The second, as a scientist, I am uh, impressed by the high quality of the testimony that we've been uh, privy to uh, here and the listeners on the internet and the viewers on the internet. And it begins to ta take on the task of rekindling respect for science. And uh, I've been appalled, as many of you are, in the uh, the ability of science, science to be turned to uh, these um, uh, unscientific uh, so, uh, purposes with the NIST report, for example. But I'd also like to say, uh, in my other life, I do work on the research of pharmaceuticals and the de the the. Uh, uh, way that pharmaceuticals are brought to market in the world today, and there are enormous examples of the mis manipulation of science, manipulation of cr clinical trials that bring very dangerous drugs on the market that get government approval, and until the sheer mounting death toll makes it necessary to take them off the market. So we're not alone here in the 9-11 uh, uh, movement uh, in dealing with uh, science gone really bad. Uh, here we redo, reviewed, uh, we've received well-documented evidence and some of which has been in the canon uh, for some time and others of which is brand new, at least to me. Uh, I'm thinking of the revolutions, uh, revelations by uh, Barbara Honiger about the damage to the Pentagon and, uh, for example, the new revelations by Peter Dale Scott from the book by Fenton. And, uh, as I'm sure we all do, we must commend the organizers for assembling such an impressive, impressive lineup. Some of the areas that we've thoroughly explored here, and I believe we've we've drilled down to bedrock on such topics as the physics and kinetics of the, tr of the collapse of the Twin Towers, which absolutely cannot be explained by the uh, quote-unquote official story. And we're getting really exciting insights on the chemistry of the dust and what it reveals, and perhaps even the chemistry of the dust in the lungs of the afflicted uh, first responders. That was really interesting. It does suggest that uh, there are uh, a need going forward to move forward by seeking points of purchase within the wider political arena. And I just want to uh, mention very briefly a couple of lines of inquiry that would be w well 
for us to pursue, for the 9-11 movement to pursue. I think we definitely need uh, someone from a professional controlled demolition expert uh, to look at the evidence and tell us what, uh, what, how it could have been done because that seems to be the next step. We also need uh, another influx of research from those people who are now taken off the Madoff case can now rededicate themselves to the corporate malfeasance that is implied by the destruction of the thousands of cases that were pending in the SEC, uh, in the SAC documents and filing cabinets that had to be abandoned when Building 7 came down and other similar lines of inquiry. My own interest is that uh, it occurred to me as I tried to put forward to the questioners in the last couple of days that because of the collapse of these three towers, there must be massive changes to the building codes in the United States of America, and I'm kind of willing to bet that there aren't any, and I kind of think that that is something that we definitely should be, uh, should definitely be explored. Why aren't there changes in the building codes? The, cloud, the towers collapsed. According to the recognized authorities, this is how they collapse. So what's happening in the building codes? So just to summarize, the task before the Toronto hearings and the 9-11 Truth Movement going forward is to begin to tackle and overcome the heavy inertia of the mass media as its grip on the public, the wider public. And I see in the happy warrior present here today in Mike, Senator Mike Gravel, uh, you know, chugging along, and I think you're a bit older than I am even, but uh, you're an inspiration to us all, and we hope we wish you well on the initiatives going forward, and we should try to get behind them. Thank you. I say we need uh, to know the past uh, to understand the present and the foreseen the future. This is a teach of Tucidide, a Greek historian Greek. During uh, the Toronto hearings, we have collected relevant uh, scientific uh, evidences of high level in different fields, engineering, chemistry, economic, history, political science, neuroscience, coming from impartial and independent experts. All the experts answered with accuracy and capability question by the panelists and clarified complex issues. It has been assessed particular, particularly that uh, historical truth is uh, very different from uh, official truth. And uh, this difference uh, comes from the fact that uh, official reconstruction coming from the United States state administration has been manipulated, manipulated. Other factors besides terrorist attack intentionally acted and caused the collapse of buildings of World Trade Center and of Pentagon. The public opinion cannot accept the inert and careless behavior of the United States authorities. The panel decided to present a formal charge to the General Prosecutor of the United States and the Prosecutor of New York City against the unknown responsible of the above indicated action further than crash of airplanes. And uh, to this regard, the Toronto hearing panel asked for further technical and scientific investigation by independent and impartial expert appointed by competent USA magistrate in the respect of the rules of due process of law and of the international convention ratified by United States of December 19, 
1966 on the civil and politic, politic rights to allow the panel and other interested people to access to the several documents covered by the state secret and compatible with the crime against human, humanity as event September 9, to investigate on insider trading happened in the United States between 6 and 10 December, which has been proved in scientific way by our expert. This panel trusts the use uh, United States justice and in United States willingness to accept the truth. Nevertheless, if the inert and the careless behavior should continue, we would be obliged to start legal proceedings before the International Criminal Court of Vaya, according to the Article 7 of the Court Statute. This article establishes the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court for the crimes against humanity as the 9th uh, event of uh, September. The International Criminal Court has been established in order to watch over the world of people against the crimes committed out of the declared wars. It is not a question of interference, but of justice and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> well, um, uh, I have to say I'm absolutely overwhelmed with these last four days. Uh, they have been remarkable. I feel very privileged to be here and to have participated with my distinguished fellow panelists. Um, I have to say it's very appropriate that we're here in Toronto. 9-11 uh, was an international event. And I, I, I have to say, uh, thank heaven for Canada. Um, I'm the uh, sole U.S. citizen on this panel, I happen to notice, so I have a, perhaps a special responsibility here and a, an obligation. I want to say that I am a proud and patriotic American U.S. citizen. I served in the military. I've been a federal employee. I've represented the United States as a Fulbright scholar in four countries. Um, and I think my country has a, has a proud history, not all of it, but much of it, and we've done some wonderful things, and I, I have not given up on my country. I was at the original hearings uh, when the Twin Towers were proposed in New York as a city planner uh, in 1960, I think it was 67 or 68, and I supported the building, the building of the Twin Towers proposed by David Rockefeller to keep the financial district in the downtown. It was migrating north, and that's why it was built. Um, I supported it because I felt it, was, it made good planning sense. And there was a, uh, I was well aware of the internal structure of this building. A very interesting structure, uh, unique, ac actually. Uh, I had done work in structural engineering. My first degree was in architecture. And so when I saw the, the videos of the collapse of the building, I, I said, something's fishy here. And this was in 2002. I, it was very early. And I to talked to people about it, and uh, they looked at me and rolled their eyes, as they do. Um, I made a talk uh, with, uh, in front of the World Affairs Council in my local community. These, uh, these are... Uh, councils that deal with foreign policy, and uh, uh, I said, you know, there's something fishy about nine, how 9-11 was brought down, the videos, it doesn't make sense. And, and I was hooted and booed and I had to leave the room, the guest speaker. Uh, so I had a taste of what it's all about. Uh, I learned later that the World Affairs Councils were created by Woodrow Wilson to persuade the American people to um, enter World War I, and uh, they were composed of retired military personnel. So we have a history of, of helping to promote wars that people may or may not want, uh, 
the World Affairs Councils do some good work, so I I'm not going to criticize them, uh, but th that's the origin of the, of the idea. Well, there was another reason I thought <coughs> that uh, the World Trade Center videos looked dubious, and that is uh, because I had uh, the privilege of being the president of the Fulbright Association of the United States, brought me into contact with another great senator, Senator J. William Fulbright, American and, uh, of course, the founder of the Fulbright program. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm cutting out. Okay. Uh, Senator Fulbright, I had a chance to chat with him about the Gulf of Tonkin, which was occurring about 1967, something in that range, 64. And I asked him about the Gulf of Tonkin, and he said, it's my biggest mistake of my career. Uh, accepting the word of the military that there had been an attack. Uh, it was, he took it to the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee where he was chair, and um, they, the House approved it unanimously, and the Senate approved it uh, almost unanimously, only two senators, Senator Gruning and Senator Wayne Morse, um, voting against. Uh, so the wars that are produced in these fashions have a life of their own, a chemistry of their own. Um, but uh, Fulbright was very gloomy about the future of the country, uh, having gone through this. He, he said, "You've got, you know." He warned us about it. Um, so I, uh, I uh, looked at these videos and I, I thought of, of what Fulbright had told me too. So. Um, and uh, it, it seems to me that uh, my, my doubts uh, have been confirmed here. I have found nothing in the evidence that's been presented here to change my mind. I've tried to be a fair panelist, and I went back and reread the 9-11 Commission report. I can tell you it doesn't improve with age. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, to make a, to finish up here, I, I did my first Fulbright in the Soviet Union in 1978. I'm well aware of what a, an authoritarian uh, state is like to live in, and I don't want that for my grandchildren. I want my open, free, democratic society back. And so uh, I think we have done uh, a, a marvelous thing here. We have laid out, uh, with the help of the experts, uh, this evidence, and I think it's a great beginning. Uh, I, uh, I hope we can uh, uh, see Senator Gravel's initiative take, take root and take hold and, and uh, that it gains more and more mom momentum. Uh, and Senator Fulbright, who was my, one of my heroes, he wrote in a book called The Arrogance of Power, I do not think for a moment that America, with her deeply rooted democratic traditions, is likely to embark upon a campaign to dominate the world in the manner of a Hitler or Napoleon. What I do fear is that she may be drifting into commitments which, though generous and benevolent in intent, are so far-reaching as to exceed even America's great capacities. At the same time, it is my hope, and I emphasize it because it underlies all of the criticisms and proposals I make here, that America will escape those fatal temptations of power which have ruined other great nations and will instead confine herself to doing only that good in the world which she can do, both by direct effort and by the force of her own example. Uh, Fulbright went on to write another book uh, which he titled The Price of Empire. And in it he said, the price of empire is America's soul and that is too high a price. Thank you. We have, we, we have heard, I think, remarkable statements, statements that uh, I think will resonate strongly from our four panelists, from Professor Herbert Jenkins, from Professor Richard B. Lee, from Judge and Senator Ferdinando Imposimato, and from Professor David Johnson. Could you please join me in thanking them for the extraordinary work that they have put in during the past four days?
Matthew Witt. <laughs> now, if you would kindly take your seats again, we have, we have uh, two further uh, matters. Um, we have, um, we will be watching remarks. Kevin Ryan is kindly going to prepare things for, for us. Uh, which, where shall I step, Kevin, to get out of your way? Okay. Does this is this going to obstruct people's views? We'll, we'll have to move it. We'll move it. Okay. Uh, I can. Perhaps I can. I can uh, simply. Oh, you still need to talk. A little bit. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, just a couple of. I, I will have a, f a few brief remarks about. Uh, about uh, these statements that we're going to watch. And then uh, my colleague and fellow moderator, uh, Professor Matthew Witt, will be giving us uh, some closing remarks. Uh, and w that, will, that will conclude and wrap up uh, our four-day hearings. Now, we're going to be, we're going to be uh, watching the uh, statements by 9-11 family members Bob McIlvain and Michelle Little. Um, let me, I'm, I'm sure you probably know who they are, but some details for you. Bob McIlvain is a former history teacher, and he's the father of Bob McIlvain, who at the age of 26, when he died as a victim of the 9-11 crimes, was assistant vice president for media relations at Merrill Lynch. Bob McIlvain has been a tireless investigator of the events of 9-11, He's known for his appearances on television programs with Rosie O'Donnell, Geraldo Rivera, and also in the film we heard mentioned recently, Zero, an investigation into the events of 9-11. Michelle Little is the founder of Unite in Peace, an organization dedicated to the memory of Michelle Little's brother, Fire Department of New York firefighter David M. Weiss from Rescue One, Midtown Manhattan. He was one of the many first responders who perished in the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. David's legacy of brotherhood, of unity, and of service is carried on through the organization Unite in Peace. Good evening, my name is Michelle Little. I lost my brother, firefighter David M. Weiss, out of Rescue One Midtown Manhattan on September 11, 2001. I've been asked if I want a new investigation, and what I want is a real investigation. A real investigation for real people experiencing real suffering, because we haven't heard the real answers into the tragedy of September 11, 2001 at the World Trade Center in Shanksville and at the Pentagon. It's been almost 10 years, and now the mainstream media wants to question 9-11 families, like all of a sudden it's okay to talk with us? My question is, are you ready to listen? Hello, my name is Bob McElvain. Uh, I live in Philadelphia, the suburbs of Philadelphia. My son Bobby, almost 10 years ago, died right here at the site of the North Tower. Uh, it, it's been a long 10 years. 
uh, basically all I want to do is introduce and how I've come to the point that I've, I'm doing what I'm doing now. But on September 11th, 2001, Bobby lived up at 66 between 1st and 2nd and took the subway to Fulton Street and walked over from Fulton Street where he had just started a job at Merrill Lynch, which Merrill Lynch is, we're standing on Vesey Street. Merrill Lynch is, we go down the west and make a left on west and trade across the street on west. He had just started there like two, three weeks before 9-11. And um, so my assumption is that day, we had no idea what happened to Bobby, but we came up to New York and we did find his body. We took Bobby home that week and buried him on a week later on Tuesday the 18th. For years and years, I've been trying to find out what happened that day. But in the beginning, uh, things were so frantic, you spent almost a year just grieving because you just can't figure out what happened. But I questioned the story of 9-11 immediately. But again, I, I just wasn't getting involved in that too much. I had chosen at that time to go into the anti-war movement or the peace movement. I joined a, a, a group called September 11th Family for Peaceful Tomorrows who were against the war, specifically a war because of 9-11. So I spent a lot of time doing that. I traveled around the world and it sort of culminated in right before the Iraq war where I got, I got arrested in front of the White House, which is one of the best things I've ever done in my life uh, because it, it just felt good. I've traveled around the world. I've been to Japan to honor the uh, or about five years ago, we walked from Nagasaki to Hiroshima honoring the civilians killed in wars, and in particular, the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I've been to Bogota, Colombia, talking about basically what I felt at that time, the blowback of American foreign policy has created this havoc that we have in the world. And of course, I went to all, most of the 90% of the 9-11 commission hearings. Well, my whole life changed after Condoleezza Rice uh, testified, and I, I don't call it testimony. As far as the case of uh, Condoleezza Rice, it was a filibuster. Uh, they were questioning her about this August 6th memo that Osama bin Laden was supposed to attack the United States. And of course, I assume everyone knows what a filibuster is, but she just talked nonsense. And each commissioner only had five minutes to speak up or to ask questions. Well, anyway, that ended. Nothing was said. Nothing was done. All the commissioners are Saran and Condoleezza Rice shaking her hands. Everyone's smiling. And that's when I lost my cool. It was after that that I, I did an interview. I was angry. And I've been angry ever since. I realized the investigation was a total sham. And I think everyone in the world knows that the investigation was a total sham. Even the commissioners admit, that, some of the commissioners admit that it was a sham. So I've dedicated my life since then to just concentrating on 9-11 truth. Even at that time, I felt strongly that there were people within the United States who were involved in this, but who knew? So since 2004, I've dedicated my life to what happened that day. And I've been very global in that thinking. You know, you talk about put options, you talk about NORAD, you talk about so many other things that are so important to 9-11. But I've noticed when I talk to people, I, they get glassy-eyed because there's so much information. Now, all this time, I'm looking into 9-11. I'm also looking into, and I think if anyone's lost a child, specifically murdered, but you always want to know exactly what happened to your child. You know, I know people that lost a child in a car accident. They wanted to know, did that child suffer? And that, that's a big part. You just, you know, I could never figure out what happened to him. We took Bobby home that week. It was one of the first 10 bodies found. I never viewed the body itself because they said, and I'm glad I didn't, because it was truly mangled. But his whole body was taken home. Well, I, a few years ago, I finally ran into the doctor who examined uh, Bobby, and he gave me an outline. He told me not to look at the pictures, but he gave me an outline of all his injuries. And this was very revealing to me because there was over 100 phone calls made to Bobby that morning, and of course not one of them was answered. Now, if he was anywhere, he would immediately have answered that phone. So what was happening, I think, this is my scenario, he came down to Fulton Street, walked over here, and decided to go to a seminar that was on the 106th floor of the old North Tower. And 
we ruled out that he was on the 106th floor because we, he wouldn't have been one of the first 10 bodies found. We thought maybe he jumped, but the thing is he had one small break on his leg and all his injuries were in the chest and in the face. Back of him, no problem. His skull was still intact, but everything was blown off his face. He lost his arm and severe lacerations of his chest. So from what I talked to the doctor, Bobby died instantly. He didn't have a chance to pick up his phone or answer in the, uh, the uh, cell phone. So through the years, and of course in my investigation, and I'll get to that real fast after we're done this, I am talking to so many EMS workers, so many firemen, so many policemen, the explosions that were taking place at, in the towers before and after the plane hit. And this is the most important point to me. The 9-11 Commission hearings states that a fireball from the plane hitting from the 93rd to up to the 98th floor because the plane went in on an angle, the fuel was in the uh, the wings, and the 9-11 Commission reports attributes the damage to the lobby, where many firemen have told me it looks like a bomb went off in the lobby. Bombs went off in the sub-basement. I've had reports that the bombs went off before the tower plane hit. So my scenario is that the idea, again, the Commission saying that only a fireball created this damage, the explosions that were going off in the basement and in the lobby, I feel Bobby walked into the lobby, or might not have even made it into the lobby, and there was a huge explosion. And what finally caught me on as far as exactly what happened to Bobby, I was wondering why, well, if they said it was a fireball, he would have had severe burns, because within the North Tower, you had people that were charred. People's bodies were cut in half, but everybody was charred. And I'm saying to myself, well, what happened to Bobby? I don't know exactly where they found him. But, and this is a key point. In an explosion, in a detonation, the air that shoots out from that explosion is supersonic. The gases shoot out in supersonic speed, and then the heat follows it. The fireball, supposedly, that came down does not have that energy. Remember, every window in the North Tower was blown out. You have an area of 208 feet by 208 feet. It's impossible that a fireball created that damage. So therefore, my thing with Bobby was that he walked, was walking into the towers. There was a huge explosion. It killed him instantly, hit him in the face, hit him in the chest, obviously took off his arm, and that's how he died. So I give presentations now, I say, well, how in the world did those explosions take place? And my point being is there's no way in the world Muslims set those detonations. The planes, it was impossible that the planes created that havoc. So when I'm talking to you nice people up and <laughs> you great people up in Toronto, if you could, Please, please spend time on these explosions. There's so much testimony, and remember the 9-11 Commission report refused to acknowledge the testimony they got from firemen, from policemen, from the EMS workers of these explosions that were taking place in the sub-basement. And both the 9-11 Commission report and NIST lied about that. NIST said that there were no explosions, so why do we have to test the steel that came from the towers. So, do I want a new investigation? To quite frankly with you, I don't care if there's a new investigation. I know it's necessary, but I can't believe an honest investigation will never take place. You're having hearings up in Toronto. I, I just think it's such a wonderful thing because it's gonna put this information out to hopefully the whole world. And from that, maybe we would have a nonpartisan objective investigation. But just for me, please spend the time on those explosions because that's a key, key point to me, that if these explosions took place, I can't believe, I know that the Muslims did not set those explosions within, or those bombs within the towers. And I would rather exonerate or let the Muslims of the world off the hook. The fact that, you know, I'm getting to the point where I don't really care who murdered Bobby. But the thing is, we're in a constant war. And it's based on what happened that day, what happened that morning. And these are explosions that took place.
So I really wish you luck in Toronto. My spirit is with you, but my family, we're here at Ground Zero every September 11th. Oh, I'm getting sick of that also, especially since Bush is going to be down here. But we'll be here. So I will be thinking of you, and I just want you all to stay strong and do your thing. Thank you. That's a very powerful and very moving testimony. And uh, now, um, while my my colleague and fellow moderator Matthew Witt is, Matthew, do you want do you want to use this other thing? Would it be easier than no? Okay. Wh while he's moving one computer down and another one up, um, I, I would just like to say that uh, say how how very grateful. Uh, I am to him for his work, not just over the over the over the past uh, four days, but but uh, over previous weeks. Um, grateful to him for the energy and leadership in the preparation of our contributions to these hearings. Uh, he he really is the one who got us moving in doing the work that we had to do, and and I, I thank him for it. And. Uh, And I thank Matthew as well for the ener for the the good judgment and tact that he's shown throughout in in uh, in his moderating of this these hearings. Thank you, Michael, very much. Um, boy, I've been asked by Professor Michael Keeper to provide a few closing remarks here today. It is my uh, honor to do so. Whew. Each of you have sat in the front row of history these last few days. Those online have the balcony section. Michael and I have been here at the elbow. I can't describe fully what a thrill that has been. Please know that the words we have shared here were drafted almost entirely by, prof by Professor Kiefer. I miswrote it here, Professional Kiefer. <laughs> Please know that I have never myself before spoken with such diction and precision. Uh, to which the next few comments I will make here, uh, the next few moments here, will give a clear testament. The steering committee is, I think, likewise very grateful for Michael's initiatives to gather essential facets of speaker and panelist biographies. I am likewise indebted to Professor Kiefer for feedback to me on some of these thoughts I, I, I will share with you. I wish also to thank Nadine Francis, who's in the audience. Uh, for her gracious review of these thoughts uh, when I'm reasonably certain an impartial panel would agree she would have preferred sleeping last night. Um, I'm entitling uh, these uh, brief comments um, Skin in the Game. In scene seven of, a one, uh, of the one-act play Galileo by Bertolt Brecht, a bemused and rattled Galileo speaks with an assistant, the little monk, after being beaten and tortured by the Inquisition. Galileo speaks, here is writ what draws the ocean when it ebbs and flows. Let it lie there. Thou shalt not read. The little monk has picked up the manuscript. Already, an apple of the tree of knowledge. He can't wait. He wolfs it down. He will rot in hell for all eternity. Look at him. Where are his manners? Sometimes I think I would let them imprison me in a place a thousand feet beneath the earth where no light could reach me if in exchange I could find out what stuff that is. Light. Sorry. The bad thing is that when I find something, I have to boast about it like a lover or a drunkard or a traitor. That is a hopeless vice and leads to the abyss. I wonder how long I shall be content to discuss it with my dog. Little monk, I don't understand this sentence. I'll explain it to you, says Galileo. I'll explain it to you. They are sitting together on the floor. There seems more than one testament implicitly made here in, in, in this passage, and anyway, one very clear sacrament also made here that I want to speak very briefly about for what it is worth pertaining to the last four days I will never forget. 
When I think about gravity, I mean really think about it, I start to feel sick to my stomach. The vertigo feeling. This has come up earlier. Lance DeHaven Smith spoke of this. I never can quite shake it. Don't get me wrong, I accept the law of gravity. I just don't want, I just don't quite know how it works. Um, I don't quite get it. I don't know how I can be standing on something spinning 24,000 miles per hour, hurtling at least some 60 th 67,000 miles per hour around the sun. I'd tell you what that meant in kilometers, but I'm just going to blame my exceptionalist American education for I can't do so at the moment. I feel vertigo because I believe I should be feeling vertigo. If I, as I ponder this, I don't think about gravity or my feelings about it. If I, as such, I'm just fine. If ever confronted, do you believe in the law of gravity? Of course, I can see the point and I move on. I can see where accepting this one particular law is at the end of the day, no skin off my nose. Institutions all around me make that so, at least so I have thought for the most part until my initiation into full inquiry of 9-11 by the valiant witnesses presenting to us all here these last few days. When I ponder the horrendous crimes of 9-11, I likewise feel sick to my stomach. It's a different sickness, but every bit as much vertigo inducing as has been given testament here. Human consciousness eventually assimilated the pertinence of gravity and made peace with what it meant, once a heresy against ultimate authority, although it was, and we moved on. Institutions were erected that one way or another gave testament to the witness of science about gravity. And, and have no mistake about it, we have given witness to science here these last few days, for it has been on trial for 10 years. This did not happen all at once, of course. The stigmata of heresy had to be first little by little diminished. Under panelist questioning, Niels Herrett yesterday resisted being pinned down about what the science from dust samples reveals about what entirely happened with 9-11. What he did offer helped sum up for me personally, perhaps you also, what I would have otherwise never put my finger on. He said about the event of the towers collapsing that categories like incendiary or explosive or thermitic might at this point in history be irrelevant or maybe even misleading. Maybe, he told us, what happened with the towers event is better understood as a combination of all three. Something the world hasn't ever quite seen before or if it saw it, didn't know, didn't have a name for it. He said much more also, of course. But at this point, it seems we can tie into James Gurley's opening comments, preparing us for these hearings, himself also describing us by what we are not. We are not a grand jury, nor do we convene here under any other statutory authority. We are not a conference or an academic proceeding, and yet we have heard here a great deal of scholarship never before assembled quite like this. We are something new, something combining many things. David Chandler dared to say that people are not delusional and he artfully proved us how come. Jonathan Cole showed us what every genuine boy and girl scout curriculum ought to include and but is missing if it doesn't. And Graham McQueen showed one painstaking textual analysis at a time, the scholar I'd like to be, and step body and soul as he did himself demonstrate from privileged perspective, full tilt into what Howard Zinn dubbed the people's history. Each of these witnesses, with a score of others doing likewise, here step from privileged place into the auger of history. Like Galileo, they glimpse the redemption that God, him, her, itself, willing, others might someday do likewise, made the mysteries explicable to us all. The naming of things is powerful magic. Lance Haven Smith introduced us to new and deeply useful nomenclature, state crimes against democracy, serving as an essential framework for the placement of so much of what we have heard these last few days. From, that, from the high altitude survey of recent events, Kevin Ryan descended to the ground level of the NIST report and its artful fictions. He expanded on this exegetical, exegetical like analysis with his account of thermate and its important properties. With his characteristic precision and impeccable clarity, David Ray Griffin then explained to us the anomalies of the 9 11 Commission report, later expanding that exposition with his analysis of the anomalous accounts of flights 77 and 93. Jay Kolar guided us through the labyrinth of alleged hijacker identities. Many in the audience will, I imagine, recall while listening to Jay, may have recalled while listening to Jay, the evidence of doctored photography of Lee Harvey Oswald, alleged to be a material evidence in the Kennedy assassination. Paul Zaremka provided us review of key study of, of key studies sifting the statistical probabilities for insider training tied to the 9/11 event, making vivid sense of materials uh, that do not yield their secrets to the novice. 
Barbara Honiger featured for us, a paragon of the people's consummate insider, navigating the labyrinth of labyrinths to secure for history unassailable witness to what happened at the Pentagon. Richard Gage, founder and tireless spokesperson for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, presented us his internationally famous account for what happened and could not possibly have happened, have, have happened at the Twin Towers that fateful day, making it indelibly clear for, um, for um, uh, Mr. McIlvain just now uh, that explosions did indeed kill his son. Peter Dale Scott earlier today limbed for us how the deep state functions and dysfunctions. Lori Manuel made clear to us today how psychological mechanisms that otherwise protect us from trauma and disorientation can be turned against us under conditions of trauma and misinformation like how 9-11 seems to have been tailored. We are already very susceptible to Orwellian doublespeak once we are born, it would seem. Senator Mike Gravel is a one-person wrecking crew. Donate to the 9-11 Commission campaign. Put democracy back to work. Closing here momentarily. As with everyone here, I hope that with some time and streaming video, I'll find other needle points from the tapestry presented here to stitch into my own personal mandala for what all this means. For the time being, my mind works feebly from one quark-like image to the next that I've seen here. A tiny universe all its own made profoundly more coherent for what was shared here these last four days. Lori Manuel in particular, I thank you for making me feel better about how difficult this process is on a personal level. No one faithfully viewing these hearings can be unchanged by them as the panelists gave testament just now. This alone makes this event an unconditional success. But although we know the institution exists nominally to indict the crimes proved here, those institutions have turned against us. Michelle Kosadowski glimpsed this clearly. The truth is now a conspiracy against a consensus founded on a series of little lies and at least one ultimate lie, he told us. Those giving testament to truth must now conspire to do so, forced to huddle together in a furtive-like alliance. I do truly hope Senator Gravel's initiative hope, uh, uh, succeeds for this matter. It makes me think. Black people in America once huddled this way who wished learning how to read. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney made vivid to me how now we all suffer the stigma to which she gave such solemn testament here two days ago. For where science itself can be made irrelevant, as it has been the past 10 years, so must therefore the rest of us be that much more so marked for contempt. It's as if we are all now, black, white, or otherwise, stigmatized analogously, if not essentially, by the convenient fiction elites have made of blackness, which otherwise decent white people, myself included, have for so long accepted with little, if any, questioning. There being no skin off our nose for not doing so, for the most part, over decades and decades. I wondered at the gleam I thought I glimpsed in the congresswoman's eye as I sat up here and watched her as she joined and did herself make testament here, did not confer upon my whiteness some redemption for that matter. Did it take 9-11 for me to glimpse this wish? Where science is converted into fiction, what can we expect for civil liberties? Where bodies in motion otherwise governed by universal laws can be held in contempt, as with physical mass made unencumbered by those pesky laws of thermodynamics. Is there any law any one of us can count on, black, white, or otherwise, where gravity itself must be made to bow to the will of power? How much lower, for that matter, have all the rest of us got to bow? When people otherwise with faces and names can be extremely rendered, of what relevance is having a face or name anyway? As Lance Haven Smith and Laurie Manuel have made vivid to us, there are formidable obstacles to our consciousness in this matter, as with shallow truisms like government is too incompetent to pull off such massive fraud, and anyway, even if it could, someone would talk. Senator Mike Ravel made vividly clear for us in his testament, as I witnessed at these events, that these, uh, these begging of the questions are baloney. Then again, slavery was pulled off, the Gulf of Tonkin was pulled off, junk bonds were pulled off, exotic financial derivatives were pulled off, the Office of Policy Coordination was pulled, pulled off, as Peter Dale Scott told us, and on and on and on. All this pulled off more or less in plain sight. But when the mass media and every other institution of the land are willing to play along with contempt for laws of the universe, we've got more fundamental problems. In the late Middle Ages, so-called scholastic philosophers confronted with mounting evidence for a world governed some other way than had for so long been ex sec accepted, preoccupied themselves with uh, the relevance of angels dancing on pinheads. 
as if that was the most relevant consideration for them to sort through. I'd like to take solace in some positive headlines in the next few days, as with, um, uh, I believe it was our panelist, Professor Jenkins, mentioning. Glimpse some sort of confirmation that the beautifully shameless testaments made here have made it past the matrix sentinels for the time being indicating that this gathering has ruptured seams of hermetic consciousness that Lori Manuel gave such, such clear and, and wonderful testament for just long enough to fetch a few who were inclined to question the reassuring but brutal fiction, matrix-like fictions. In closing, I know that headlines will never be enough. I think all of us know that. But one thing I know for certain, although so many of them want free people thinking otherwise, we who are free are not lone wolves. Not now and not ever. Something other than physical laws binds us together now, us who gave witness to these testaments here, so, so wonderfully done. We might be exiles from the matrix of received wisdom from a pliant media, but as Morpheus in the film story The Matrix said, we are still here. We are honored for that matter to have been joined by Splitting the Sky, a.k.a. John Boncor Hill, who mustered unbeatable spirit from within, and the letter of law without here in Canada issue a citizen's arrest of George W. Bush. Here's to hoping soon for a world full of exiles. Thank you.